My soul will rest in your embrace. I am pure, and you are mine. So, how many of you ever had God play a practical joke on you before? Maybe a couple of you. Um, So last winter, God played a practical joke on me, one of, I think, his greatest practical jokes of all time. Uh, Last winter, during one of the really cold uh, stretches during the winter, I I noticed that my car was smelling really, really bad. Like everywhere I went, there was just like this overwhelming odor to my car. And I I pride myself on a, a clean car, so this was like really bothering me. I was embarrassed to have anyone in my car with me because the odor was just so bad and I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. Uh, I I was starting to think like, okay, is like too much uh, moisture getting in the car or something? Is is it a mildew smell? Like I couldn't place my finger on what the smell actually was. And uh, I remember my wife was saying like, I think something crawled in and died in your car. Like that's how bad it is. I'm like, no, nothing, nothing died in my car. So Uh, I finally, I take it to my mechanic, and I'm like, George, I need you to figure out why my car smells so bad. So he he kind of does his investigation of my car, and he figures out that the smell is coming through my vents. So he checks the cabin air filter, and there, sitting on top of the cabin air filter of my car, was a mouse nest filled with something. Uh, I'll let you guess what that is. It smells really bad. And three dead field mice. So something did crawl into my car and die. My wife was right the whole time. So every time, if you don't know what a cabin air filter is, it's like the air that's coming through your vents goes through the cabin air filter. So every time I would turn the heat on on my car, warm air is going through this pea-soaked cabin air filter into my vents, and that was what was creating the smell. So uh, my mechanic, he, he cleaned it all out, disinfected it, and he said, Brian, Here's the thing, though. If I change your cabin air filter, I have to charge you labor. I have to, like, upcharge you for what this costs. And he said, these are really cheap. If you go to any mechanic store, you could buy one for, like, less than $10 and do it yourself. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to save some money and do this myself. So I go to the store. I buy the cabin air filter. I come home, go in my garage, and I realize I have no idea where this goes in my car. So I do what we all do when we need to figure out how something works. I go to YouTube, and after watching a three-minute video, I now know how to disassemble the glove compartment, the little area behind it, and get to the cabin air filter. And I can promise you my car smells fantastic today. I got air fresheners and everything, and it's clean, and uh, it it smells great. But YouTube is a great resource, isn't it? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times that I, when I'm trying to figure out how to fix something, how to figure out how something works, I just go to YouTube rather than trying to read an instruction manual. Uh, even new board games now, uh, you can, it comes with instruction manuals, but right at the top, it a lot of times say, like, for an easier way to learn this game, just go to YouTube and watch someone explain you the rules. See, YouTube is key for learning how things work, but today I want to talk about learning how to pray prayers that work? How do, we, uh, how do we pray prayers that work? And honestly, you could look this up on YouTube, and you'll probably find some great advice. Uh, you'll probably find some uh, messages that talk about prayer, and you can learn a lot of things, and uh, then it's kind of up to you to determine, is this truth or is this someone's opinion? And we can do that just by looking at the Bible. Is this based on the scriptures, or is this based on someone's opinion? Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about how to pray prayers that work. And um, if this is your first week here, we've been in this series called the 40 Days of Prayer. And what we've been doing during the series, it's seven weeks long, and we've been talking about different aspects of prayer every single week. Uh, But what's different about this series is that during the week, 
Uh, we have about 250 people that are going through a small group uh, talking about uh, the message, talking about different aspects of prayer in their small group. It's based on Rick Warren's study, The 40 Days of Prayer. Uh, a lot of our messages mirror his, and uh, the study, the book, all has to do with his uh, his book, The 40 Days of Prayer. And uh, if this is your first week here, or if you're just not in a group yet, it's not too late. Um, we have, uh, I believe, 18 groups now that are going on throughout the week. Some of them here, some in Medina, some in people's homes, uh, some in businesses in our community. Um, so if you want to be a part of this group, we still have some books left. Uh, you can go on our website, see which groups are still open. Uh, we're going into our fourth week now. Uh, it's an eight-week-long small group, but many of the groups are actually a couple weeks behind uh, because of this fantastic weather we've been having this past month. Uh, so they had to cancel a week or two. So you can join one of these groups any single time. Uh, you can actually go through this yourself uh, if, like, every night of the week has something going on. Uh, we can get you one of the books if you just write it on your connection card. And all the sessions are available on YouTube. So you can go there and watch Rick Warren's sessions there. Um, but for today's message, again, we're going to uh, talk about how to pray prayers that work and how we're going to do this. I, I want to look at this passage um, that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in the New Testament. Um, now, just to give you a little bit of background on the Apostle Paul, he was once a Jewish zealot. Uh, he, he was very strong in his faith and his religion, and he was convinced that Jesus was a fraud. He was convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah. In fact, uh, he believed this so strongly that he went around arresting Christians and persecuting and killing Christians all in the name of religion until one day Jesus himself appears before Paul. This is after the resurrection and after Jesus ascended to heaven. He appears to Paul and Paul was so convinced by what he saw that he completely changed his mind. He became a Christian himself. Uh, he became someone who, who goes on to write half of the New Testament that we have today. He planted tons of churches um, all over the Mediterranean Rim. And um, while he would, he would plant these churches, and then occasionally he would go back and visit them. Uh, but more often than not, he would write letters to these churches. And these letters would teach the churches, and he would teach them theology and different things to believe and different things about Jesus and one of the churches that he planted was in Thessalonica. Uh, in fact, he wrote two letters to them. And I want to look closely at uh, this one passage in the first letter that he wrote. Because in it, I think we can learn some great things on praying prayers that work. So uh, take a look at 1 Thessalonians 3.10. Paul says this. Uh, just this first verse, we're going to get our first three points from. He says, Night and day we pray earnestly for you. Asking God to let us see you again to fill the gaps in your faith. So three things we can learn from Paul from uh, just this simple verse alone. Uh, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time on the third one. But the first one is this. Pray frequently. Pray frequently. Let me just say that God hears every single one of our prayers. But if we want to begin to, praying, uh, begin to pray prayers that work, we have to begin to pray frequently. Uh, look at what Paul wrote to a different church, the church at Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians 6, 18. He says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. See, Paul was very concerned with not just what the church was praying for, but he also cared how often uh, the Christians, the church was praying. See, here's my suspicion. I, I believe that for some of us, our past experiences with prayer or our past experiences with religion has changed the way that we pray. For example, some of us, because of your religious upbringing, you may view prayer as a ritual or an obligation. Just something that you do because you have to do, and if you're going to be a religious person, you have to do this. Uh, maybe you grew up attending a church that uh, when people prayed, they always laid their hands on your shoulders or held hands. And there was something about praying that made everyone's palms sweaty. And it just like made you uncomfortable and you, you just like didn't really enjoy it because everyone's hand is sweaty on your shoulder. Uh, may, maybe for you, prayer was linked to a location, like a sanctuary or uh, uh, a church. And you felt like you could only pray and connect with God in a certain location. 
Uh, maybe for you it was a certain position that unless you were kneeling or sitting or had your hands like this or like this, you couldn't pray. See, like most things in life, we've made it more complicated than we have to. See, go ahead and fill this in. Praying frequently means this. It means having a constant conversation with God. That's all praying frequently is, is having a constant conversation with God. Uh, I, I remember a couple months ago when we're beginning to uh, really nail down the series and uh, talk about the topics we're going to be teaching on. I, I was thinking if there's one thing that we can learn as a church about prayer, I, I think it's along these lines, that prayer is simply a conversation. It's not a ritual, it's not an obligation, there's no necessarily right way to do it. It's simply a conversation with our creator. So praying frequently is simply having a constant conversation. So to help us better understand the value and really how to pray constantly, I, I want you to think about the person in this world that you are closest to. Maybe for you it's a, a, a spouse, maybe it's a family member, a, a parent, a kid, a sibling. Uh, maybe it's just a best friend. But think of the person that you are closest to in this world. Uh, for me, it's my wife. And to give you a little insight on how we communicate throughout the day, we talk a little bit in the morning because neither of us are morning people. So we just talk a little in the morning. Uh, we talk uh, more in... I thought that was behind me. I was like, is that my... We talk a little bit in the afternoon and in the evening. Uh, we talk a lot in the evening, like during dinner, while we're running errands. That's when we talk the majority of our time. But during the day, we're also talking frequently. Even if we're at work and we're at different locations, we are talking constantly throughout the day via text message. It's, not, it's nothing deep. Usually it's one sentence or one text at a time. It could be as simple as like, hey, I, I love you. Hey, I'm thinking of you. Hey, I miss you. H how's your day going? Maybe it's uh, we're just venting about something that's happening during our day. It's nothing deep, but it's constant. And that's how I pray also. I, I, I pray a little bit in the morning because I'm not a morning person. I pray a little bit more in the afternoon and a lot in the evening when I'm, when I'm fully awake and I have time set aside. But during my day, I'm having this, this constant conversation with God. Usually it's one sentence at a time while, uh, while I'm working or even while I'm driving. God, I, I, I love you. God, thank you for this day. God, uh, I need help with what I'm, what I'm about to go into. It's this constant conversation. And uh, this is what I've learned with this constant conversation is that when I have a constant conversation with someone, it makes the deeper conversations deeper. In fact, when I sit down to have that deep conversation, it tends to go deeper because I can skip over the shallow because we've already done that. We've already talked about our day a little bit, so we can go into a deeper conversation. So instead of trying to pray better prayers, what if, what if we simply try to pray more frequent prayers? And I think if we did that, I think our prayers will be better and be deeper as we do that. So the first thing Paul talked about was to pray frequently. The second thing is this, is to pray earnestly. You go ahead and fill that in, pray earnestly. The Greek word that Paul used for earnestly means passionately and intensely. So my question is, how, how much passion and intensity is in our prayers? And if I'm being honest with you, which I, I hope by now you've realized that I tend to be, I, I like to share from my struggles and what God's doing in my heart. This is the one that I struggle with the most. I, I've learned to pray frequently. Uh, it's a habit that I developed a long time ago. Uh, the third point that we'll talk about in just a moment, I, I do pretty good at that as well. But praying earnestly with, with passion and intensity, I, I tend to do that on a more reactive basis. Uh, for example, when a friend or family member is in the hospital, when, when something is going on, when I'm at a crossroads maybe, and I'm trying to figure out which way to go, my prayers will have a lot of passion and intensity then, but that's more of a reactive basis. Like I, I'm reacting to what's going on. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I put this quote in your, your notes. I love this quote. He says, he says this, I've been driven many times to my knees by the conviction that I had nowhere else to go. I can relate to that because when I feel like I have nowhere else to go, I, I pray with passion. I'm on my knees. I'm, I'm praying intensely.
But again, it's reactive. What I've been trying to do is to pray with passion and intensity on a more proactive basis. So practically, this is what this has looked like for my life. I've begun to pray more out loud. We don't have to pray out loud. The Bible doesn't uh, command us to pray out loud. We, we know that God can hear our hearts. He can hear our thoughts. So there's nothing wrong with praying silently to yourself. But I've just realized that I don't think with a lot of emotion. When I pray with my thoughts and I pray just with my heart, I, I don't think my prayers with a lot of emotion or with a lot of intensity. And not only that, but I can get pretty distracted when I think my prayers. I'm good for like 30 seconds or maybe a minute or two, and then it's like all of a sudden my to-do list is competing with my prayers, and before you know it, I'm like switching the laundry or doing something that has nothing to do with what I was praying about. But I've learned that if I pray out loud, my prayers tend to be so much more focused, and there's a lot more emotion and intensity in them. So what I would recommend to you, if maybe you find this weird or awkward, I, I would recommend simply by starting with this. Start reading the Psalms out loud. The Psalm is a collection of poems and songs and prayers, uh, many of which King David wrote. And I, I've just been, in, in my own practice, I've been reading the Psalms out loud and then right afterwards praying out loud. Now, I don't do this in public. I don't, you're not going to see me like at a waiting room in a doctor's office reading the Lord's Prayer or reading the Psalms or anything like that. But if I'm home, if I'm alone, I, I read the Psalms out loud, declaring them over myself and then praying out loud. And I, I'm just telling you, for me, it's helped my prayers to be much more focused and it's helped them to be much more filled with emotion and passion. So we pray frequently we pray earnestly. And the third thing is this, is to pray specifically. Pray specifically. See, I, I think our natural tendency when we pray is to pray general prayers. And it's probably for a couple different reasons. Maybe one, you're, you're afraid of being disappointed if God doesn't come through with what you are praying for specifically. You have this fear that you're going to be disappointed. Or, or maybe you're just afraid that if you pray specifically, you're telling God what to do. So we pray general prayers like, God, bless the world. God, protect everyone I know. God, be with everyone I know. And they're very, they're, they're great prayers, but they're very general. And there's not a lot of, uh, we're not praying specifically. But what we can learn from Paul and what we can learn from the scriptures is that we have permission to pray boldly. Look at what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.16. It says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. What I love about this verse is um, you got to remember the context that this was written in. If there was a throne room, if they went to Rome and they approached the throne, you approach the throne with your head down, you don't look up, you, you can't approach the throne of Rome boldly. So this was not only permission to just approach a throne, but to approach the king of kings, the lord of lords, boldly. This would have been brand new to the followers of Jesus. That they have permission to approach the throne boldly. See, fill the sin. Praying boldly is not telling God what to do. It is asking God to act. Prayer is a means that God gives us to give us what he wants to give us. It's a means that he uses. Sometimes I believe that he's waiting on us to pray for something before he gives us what he wants to give us. There's this line that uh, you may have heard it before that prayer does not change circumstances. Prayer changes us. And I understand where people are coming from when they say that. And what I, what I think they really mean is that prayer doesn't change God, it changes us. Which that's true. God, we, we know God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the Alpha and the Omega. God's not changing. And, and prayer absolutely changes us. But I also believe that prayer does and can change circumstances. There's a, a Christian novel by a guy named Frank Peretti. Uh, it's called This Present Darkness. 
And it, it's completely fiction, so obviously we don't want to like take our, we don't want to build theology around a fictional book. Uh, but this book has really, it, it's given me a lot of insight onto prayer. It, it's helped me to change the way I think about prayer. So in this book, uh, it's, it's all about spiritual warfare. If, if you read it, you would know that, that it's about angels and demons. And uh, there's these battles where angels are fighting demons. And uh, in the book, the angels would be activated into battle by the prayers of Christians. There would be times where there's a, a spiritual battle going on for someone's soul or, or someone's behavior even, and the angels would be waiting on the sideline until someone started praying until they can engage in that battle. And not only that, but uh, the angels, while they're in battle, they would get their strength from prayers of Christians. And I, I love this line in the book. So it, it's towards the end of the book where the head angel is fighting kind of the head demon. And they're, they're kind of battling back and forth. And for a second, it looks like the demon's going to win. But then it says this line in the book, uh, talking about the demon, it says that his eyes were full of evil and hate. And he slashed with his big sword. But the prayers, dot, dot, dot. The prayers could be felt everywhere and the general could not be defeated. Now again, we don't build our theology around this. And to be honest, I don't know the ins and outs of spiritual warfare, but I do believe that prayer affects it. I do believe that prayer can affect our circumstances. So as we continue these 40 days of prayer these next couple months, this is my challenge to you. Pray specifically and pray boldly. So we got our first three points from uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.10. What, what I want to do now, I want to pray, or I want to talk a little bit more about how to pray specifically. Like, what can we do? What are ways that we can pray more specifically? So I want to look at the next couple verses out of that first passage to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.11 says this. It says, May God our Father and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. May God our Father and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. This is something that Paul was praying and uh, what he was doing, he was praying to be with the church. He was praying to be with the church at Thessalonica and uh, if you rewind a little bit in chapter 2 of this letter, he wrote to them that he wanted and he was trying to be with them but Satan was preventing him. Now, we don't know exactly how he was prevented from seeing them, but Paul was praying to be with them. So one way that we can pray specifically is this. You can fill it in. is to pray for God to remove obstacles. Pray for God to remove obstacles. So rather than just praying for something to happen, we can also pray for a couple things not to happen. If we're praying for X, it's okay to pray for Y and Z not to happen. Uh, for example, you can pray for a friend to come to Jesus. That is a good prayer. That's a specific prayer. That's something we should all pray for our friends. But we could pray even more specifically if we pray that God would also remove the obstacles that are in the way of that person coming to Jesus. So what that could look like is you pray for that friend to come to Jesus, but maybe you also pray that an addiction that they're dealing with like that they can overcome that addiction, that maybe if they're surrounded by a group of friends and those friends are influencing them poorly, that you, you pray that they can find new friendships, that those obstacles are removed. Maybe it's as simple as you invite them to church every single Sunday and they always have something going on. And it's the, maybe the answer to prayer is that their plans are just free, that those obstacles would be removed. In Acts 20 verse 1, we find out that Paul's prayer was eventually answered. It says this, that Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, he said goodbye and he set out for Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is kind of like, uh, the best way to put it is, it's like the, con or it's the county that Thessalonica was in. So if he made it to Macedonia, he definitely made it to Thessalonica. So he, his prayer was answered. So try this for yourself. Rather than just praying that specific prayer about something, pray that the obstacles around that, the obstacles around what's preventing you from, preventing that from happening, pray that those are removed as well. The second thing is this, is to pray for God to increase love. That we pray for God to increase love. Verse 12 of that same passage, 
says this, and says, and may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. So let me ask you a question. What do we call gaining weight without gaining muscle? Getting fat. <laughs> we gain weight, but we're not gaining muscle. We are just gaining fat to our bodies. So anything we do, spiritually speaking, without gaining love, it's just gaining spiritual fat. If we gain knowledge, for example, without love, we are getting a fat head. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says this, it says, But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. You've heard me say this before, that we don't need smarter Christians. We need Christians who begin to love the world the way that Jesus loved the world and puts, puts action behind their love. I mean, Jesus said that that's how his followers were supposed to be known, was by their love. We don't just want knowledge, we need love. If we try increasing uh, serving others without increasing love, we get pride. We're filled with pride and we think that we get a, a savior complex or a messiah complex that we're the ones that are doing good for the world and uh, then our motivation changes and before you know it, we're not doing good things anymore and we're not serving people anymore. Even faith applies here. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, or, uh, 13, 2. It says, And if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Increasing our love is one of the most significant things that God can do in our life. And as it increases, Paul's telling us, don't just let it increase in your life, but let it overflow to others. W what I think he means by that is if we just fill our life with love, but we don't let it overflow, love is just an emotion. We, we, we feel love towards people, but if we let it overflow, the emotion turns into action. And we begin showing people our love through our actions, through sharing resources, by taking care of others, by being there when they need us. So this is how we can do this practically. Pray specifically, God, increase my love for, and fill in the blank. Maybe it's a, a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor, a spouse, a kid. God, increase my love for this person. I promise you God will answer this prayer every single time. Even if it's our enemy that we're praying for, just the act of bringing the, them up in prayer will increase our love for them. That doesn't mean we have to be their best friend. We don't even have to be friends with them, but it will increase our love towards them. We'll begin to see them in a different light. So we pray for God to remove obstacles. We pray for God to increase our love. And the third one is this is we pray for a change of heart. Verse 13 says, May he, God, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy. That's a change of heart. As you stand before God our Father, when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. Strong, blameless, and holy. Listen, pray specifically for your circumstances. Pray boldly for your circumstances. But don't stop with your circumstances. Pray that God would change our hearts as well. Pray that God would help us to see things in a different light, that he would help us change our hearts so we can trust him more, so that even if our consequences don't change, we can still trust him. I, I said before, I believe that prayer changes circumstances, but not every time. Sometimes God in his sovereignty will allow things to happen and we will never understand it in our entire lives. We won't understand why, we won't understand how, we just, we just won't understand it. So don't stop with praying for your circumstances. Pray that God would change our hearts. By the way, the last week of the series, week seven, we're going to be talking about what to do when God says no. What to do when the circumstances don't change? How do we trust God when something bad happens, when bad things happen to good people or good things happen to bad people? What do we do in a situation like that? But it begins with praying for a change of heart. We all need that pray, prayer. Pray for people around you, that their hearts would be changed. We need strong hearts to face the challenges that we face in this life. 
So a few weeks ago, uh, week one of the series, Pastor Rick had mentioned uh, our kids director, Beth, and her husband, Brian, and some of the struggles that they were going through. Uh, if you weren't here that week, it's available online, but the, the summary of the story is that when Beth was 27 weeks pregnant, they went in and she was at her doctor's appointment and they ran a few tests, the, the traditional tests, and they realized that the baby's heartbeat was irregular. So they sent her to the hospital and uh, the hospital did some more tests and they, they found that the heartbeat was, for the baby was 270 beats per second, which is not good. So the, the doctors, they were recommending that Beth be induced into labor, that maybe she could have a few minutes with her son before he passes away. Uh, my wife and I, we got this text message of the situation and the update um, on a Friday. We were with some friends, and uh, it was hard for us for a few different reasons. Uh, one is that Beth and Brian are just very close friends of ours. Uh, Danielle, my wife, she grew up with Beth. She was in our wedding. We're very close with Brian as well. So for it to happen to someone so close to us was hard. Another reason is uh, Danielle and I, we lost a child during the first trimester uh, years back. And we weren't nearly as far along as Beth and Brian were, but it still brought back some of the painful memories and some of the pain that we, we dealt with. Also, right now, Danielle is pregnant. Just a couple months behind Beth, so it brought this fear that we really haven't been experiencing up until that point. And also, we were visiting friends who just had a baby, a month-old baby boy, perfectly healthy. So here in this, in this room, we get this text message, and we realize that right here we have this perfectly healthy baby boy. We have this baby in the womb yet to be born, and our friends are dealing with with something they never thought that they would deal with before, like in their entire life. So right there in their living room, we begin to pray. You better believe we prayed specifically. The doctors had given them a 1% chance of that baby surviving. We prayed, we were praying boldly, God, we are praying for a miracle. You better believe we were praying earnestly with passion and intensity. We were praying, God, we know that the doctor said 1%, but we believe that you can, that that doesn't matter to you. We were praying for that baby's heart. We were praying specifically for the doctors. We prayed frequently over those next few days that God would perform a miracle in this baby. We were praying for a change of heart that God would show us ways that we can support Beth and Brian the best that we possibly can. So the plan was, Monday morning, this all happened Friday, that Monday they would induce Beth into labor. And what I was going to do was go to the hospital and hopefully baptize that baby before he passed away. I'll be honest with you, I was pretty numb for a couple days trying to figure out, like, what do I possibly say? What do I do? How do I react? What is the best way to show the love of Jesus? And I didn't know in this situation. But Monday morning they ran some more tests and they go into Beth and Brian's room and they're kind of explaining these tests and uh, they kind of notice a shift in the doctor's voice and they're like, hold on, you're telling us there's hope? The doctors are like, yeah, there's hope. In fact, we're saying like now it's more like a 75% chance that this baby's going to survive, but you're going to have to stay in the hospital because the medication we're giving you is pretty strong. A couple weeks later, the doctors come back in. They say, Beth, you can go home. Baby's reacting to the medication. You can go home. I was talking to Brian in the foyer today. He said, just a couple days ago, the doctor, they classified the pregnancy as a normal pregnancy now. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe prayer changes circumstances. A little bit of the story was shared on the WDCX uh, Facebook page, and they got over 1,200 responses. I believe there was people all over Western New York and Canada that were praying for baby Max. We prayed earnestly. We prayed as a staff. I, I would pray here every morning right at the front of this altar, specifically and boldly by this baby's name. 
talking to Brian, he said, we are going to have the biggest party when this baby is born. I'm like, you better believe we are. So we're going to take communion in just a moment. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Is there something that you've been afraid to ask God for? That you need to pray boldly for today? Is there a specific prayer that you need to pray specifically for? I'm going to just ask you, when you come to the table, pray that to God. Bring that prayer to him, trusting that God has the power to change circumstances and he will absolutely change our hearts. So I'm going to pray and then I'll remove the the lids of this and I'll invite you to come. But would you pray that? Would you pray that whatever it is for you, that God would move, that he would change those circumstances? God, I thank you so much for the gift of prayer that you give us. The ability that we have to communicate with you, the creator of the universe, the God who loves us and views us as sons and daughters. So God, we lift up all these prayer requests today. Everything that's going on in our lives, God, the circumstances that seem like they're out of our control, God, we know that you are a powerful God. God, we pray for baby Max. And we thank you for what you're doing in that situation. We pray that you would continue to bless that family. That Max can continue to grow stronger. And that the birth would go great. God, we lift up all these prayer requests to you this morning. We pray this in your name.